So hello and welcome again to Summertime Science. I wanted to do something a bit special today. Um, normally what we're very interested in is very recent graduates experiences. I wanted to, to look at a slightly longer term view. So I found one of our graduates from a little while ago. Um, this is Dr. Phil Rogers. And um, uh, and and he's talking to us from his apartment in Jakarta. Um, so welcome to Summertime Science, Dr. Rogers. And um, thank you, thank and, you, Dr. Phil. Yes, <laughs> it's nice so, to be um, here. Yeah, it's, it's 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 very good to have you. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to talk. Um, a little bit about um, you getting into university and, 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 and what you did um, and then talk about your trajectory out of university and what sort of advice you might have for students um, just so that we can fit a time frame around this. How long ago did you graduate? How long ago did I graduate? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, my first degree, um, I graduated in 2001. And then I went on to do a PhD, which um, lasted a few years. Technically, they should only last three years, but um, but ecology PhDs tend to accumulate or need to accumulate quite a bit of um, field data. So I eventually graduated from that in 2009. We'll wow, go into okay. more detail as to why that was so long. <laughs> in a minute. Brilliant. OK, so just um, in terms of how, how you ended up at university, can you just take us through 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 young Phil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, well, I think like many, many people um, that perhaps are attracted to the sciences. Yeah, it happened to me at a very young age. I got um, had influences such as reading uh, Gerard Duhal's uh, My Family and Other Animals that many people people do and um, and I and I, li I lived in the countryside as well so I had a big exposure um, at a young age to to the countryside around me and um, saw sort of various environmental changes um, that occurred in the in the 70s and 80s um, and these are things like elm Dutch elm disease um, attacked all the elm trees um, around our, our home and um, and um, and then and then all of this um, green space that was that was there was then um, was then removed and they built a um, a factory park on it, an industrial um, park. So I it quite I think looking back that was quite a pivotal point that um, made okay. me think about the environment and environmental change. And um, it didn't sort of happen until much later, until around 1989, that I got really interested in it. And that was about the time of the Earth Summit and um, world leaders and countries were just getting ready for um, the Rio Summit in um, Brazil, Rio de, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, 1992. Um, huge event globally. And there was a lot of, um, lot of fanfare and noise made about it. And and I was quite struck by that, and it was it was very much um, interesting topics that were talked about were deforestation and global warming. Now, isn't that funny? Thirty years on, we're still talking about them, um, <laughs> yeah, which is which is in some it. ways a failure, a, a mass failure of um, humanity to to tackle these two critical issues. So yeah. 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 So that was the that was the point when I thought, right, I want to sort of dedicate my life to and to doing something yeah. about the environment and, and and perhaps fixing things. And so I was very at that point, it was a very much a decision I made to um, to focus on the environment. Were you an environmental activist for a bit? I was, yes, yes, I, I was. I seem to remember something about a protest yeah. about a bypass. Oh, well done. So, yeah, so, um, so uh, I got, so post-1992, I got really involved with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth during the 90s and, um, and um, went along to national protests and um, and that was really really interesting um, and sort of galvanized me more um, over that period uh, but then I started to realize okay this only goes so far you can only do so much by shouting and as we know politicians listen and then sometimes change tact and do other things um, not necessarily doing what you want them to do 
Um, so um, so that's when I thought, right, I've got to sort of do more. And that's when the sort of the seed of going to university um, entered my head. And um, and um, I thought, right, yeah, maybe a, a degree in environmental science or, or, or related mm. would be a really good thing to do. So yeah, okay. that's that's that started. So I didn't, I didn't. So I got to um, Christchurch in 1998, after after tackling an A level or two, um, and and that was that really sparked my interest. I had, did an an early um, um, A level in environmental science, and uh, did a field study on the Little Stour in Kent, and that really sort of um, really interested me in terms of aquatic ecology. So that's where it started. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. And um, so as you're going through university, I mean, you've now got over a decade's post university experience. Is there anything that you wish you'd done differently or, or, or any advice you've got for people who are either thinking of coming to university now or at university at the moment? Oh, um, yeah. So so I I um, graduated in I well, left university Christchurch in 2006 and um, and um, got a job um, at a company consultancy company called AMEC and um, and yeah that was what 10 years on now we're, we're in 2020 aren't we so it's um, it's good 10 years of professional experience and um, that has t just taken me all over the place but as for sort of students today um, and what they might be thinking about or where they might be wanting to go in life. I, I think doing doing the degree really, really did help. And um, and I didn't know what I was going to do um, after my first degree. And and I think that was a, a pivotal point. I didn't feel ready to go in, into the workplace. I wanted to do more sort of um, university time because I came I came in at university as a mature student at the age of 28, which is obviously a lot older than um, many younger students. But um, mm. but um, that made me think, well, OK, let's let's think about this, maybe a master's. I actually thought about a master's um, in Sheffield on in desert ecology. And um, and then and then an opportunity came up at Christchurch to do a scholarship PhD. And mm. that interested me because being a mature student, I was already living in Canterbury, uh, obviously had bills to pay. Um, and so I had to think about that. So unfortunately, or fortunately, the sensible side of me kicked in and I thought, right, I'll stay at Christchurch and um, and do the PhD there, which I don't regret at all. It was it, that was equally the right decision. Maybe going to Sheffield might have been the right decision mm. as well. So. Um, I don't think I don't think um, there's necessarily right or wrong decisions in life. I think sometimes if we feel we're in the wrong position, doing the wrong job and we don't like it, we hate it, then I think that's a sign to point you in the right direction. Um, and that's where I was before I went to university. I was in a job that I'd been there for quite some time. I didn't like I wasn't I wasn't getting paid at all. Well, not even enough to buy a house. Um, and that's when I thought, well, I've got to sort of galvanise myself to, to get through a university course and um, and think about um, think about the future. So it was all about thinking about the future, but I didn't know necessarily where I was going. So you you found yourself. I mean, this is this is part of the story where where we kind of where, where the two of us come together because whilst yeah. working. Six of us were doing our PhDs. Um, yeah. A friend of ours asked us if we wanted to get involved in a newt survey. In, in well, it, well, yeah, it goes back it even friend. more before that, doesn't it, Phil? Don't forget, yeah. two thousand. Um, I think we were on this course in Greece, um, yes. doing this. Really, actually, this was a really interesting point, and this is another aspect I think um, students today should. Um, be focused on. If you get an opportunity to go to Europe and do a do a um, an Erasmus course, and and you and I did this um, short uh, short term three week course on um, yeah. monitoring European rivers, and it was and it was a fantastic course, wasn't it? We we met a load of people from all over Europe. Um, we, we it was quite intensive, and we did all these different aspects to do with rivers, including dam 
dam engineering, if I remember at some point, and some Greek lecturer was teaching us about the um, equations of what you need to know to build a dam. I'm not yes. too sure I've actually used that in my life, but um, <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> I, I look back on that, and again, that was a really interesting um, course that sort of guided me into the future. So, um, so, um, yeah, so, so that was when we first met, and um, yes, if you and then think, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then we didn't. And then I got to start the PhD in two thousand and one, and then met you again. Um, so we'd known each other for quite some time. And then, mm. and then again, yeah, leaping over the PhD stuff, um, we come to the pivotal point when when I was running out of money and <laughs> I needed to find a job, and um, and um, we were just uh, we were just getting prepared in terms of what we were going to do post PhD life, and we had a good colleague ex um, ERG ecology research group um, um, uh, um, friend that um, that um, had already set up his consultancy he was already doing surveys new surveys great crested new surveys and he said to us you know we ought to um, get some experience and try and get a license to to survey for newts and that's where the sort of cons consultancy side of it started and um, we did a course in why um, and that taught us how to handle newts, how to capture them. Um, they had sort of ecological uh, life cycles and um, and that was the pivotal moment that led on to a to a job. So this um, particular piece of work came up in Kent, um, a pipeline project that needed all of Kent's um, licensed ecologist people um and and somehow uh john found out about it and and he informed us and and even the job the job came to me by another person as well so two independent um friends had heard about it and said oh there's a job in north kent to do some um newt surveys what do you want to do, do you, would you like to do it and so of course yeah i said yeah let's go for it um so that was about um that was about 2006, um, April, and uh, went up to the Isle of Grain on a very cold, miserable day. And yeah. John and I had an induction and um, found out about the project. And then, and then um, that was it. We were scheduled to work for three months on this project, um, collecting new data. Um, but they needed um, some supply staff to support some of the survey work. And so um, they asked me to come back the next day to to act as a buddy, and um, and uh, it was there I met um, a, ch a guy called Rufus uh, Rufus Howard, and um, Rufus um, is now Doctor Rufus Howard. Um, mm. He um, he um, he sort of um, get, sort of told me all about sort of a consultancy and um, what you do, and then and then said, would you like to come and work? Um, for us, so I thought, oh, wow, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> second, second day on the job, and they're already offering me something. Okay, so, can, um, you, can you just give some idea of the scope of where that work with AMEC took you? I'm thinking geographically oh, as much yeah. as yeah, yeah. Well, well, the job, um, the job lasted about ten years um, with AMEC, um, 2006 to to about 20, 2014, 15. I started with UK work and um, focusing on, on um, um, nationally important infrastructure like gas pipelines, electricity, um, pylon uh, routes, transmission lines. Um, that then uh, led on to um, international work and I got um, assigned to an office in Kent um, in Ashford and they were primarily a mining team and they did uh, mining all around the world. And so from the Isle of Grain, I then started to go to places like Romania um, uh, was my first assignment and went there for um, a few months working on this huge mining project, gold mining project. And uh, then went on to places like Sudan um, in 2008. Um, and then and it just it took off after that. There was a huge mining boom um, around 2008, 2015. And um, and it took me all over the place, um, West Africa, Central Africa, um, mm. Europe, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, um, Central Asia, uh, places like Kyrgyzstan, um, Az Azerbaijan, um, uh, places in West Africa like Liberia, Ghana, uh, Guinea, 
um, uh, Central Africa, the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, here, huge number of places um, I ended up going and, to, which I ne would never have foreseen in my life. Um, yeah, which well, is really I, I, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think that this is um, what really impresses me with this is 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 the fact that it almost hinges on us listening to John Bramley, this yeah. lovely consultant yeah. guy and yeah. doing a bit of training on newt identification yeah. which then led to a yeah. survey on the isle of grain which oh, then absolutely. Led, yeah which then yeah. led to all these other things and and i mean i don't know what you think but i you never know which opportunity is going to take you somewhere and and I, again yeah. i can remember in the early days with you you got a job at amec mm. and you're walking up and down pylon lines making yeah. sure you know that they're, yeah. they're they're safe and and it's yeah. one of those you know just for a moment you're like oh oh well this you know, <laughs> this, well, you know where have I found myself as a as a new graduate yeah. but then it yeah. led to all this amazing stuff and I think mm. that's um mm. that's really cool um what I'd just like to ask you about is are there any particular skills that you have developed that are the, the, the most important skills for getting into this sort of work? Skills, right, yeah, well definitely um, excellent report writing, um, yeah, it's the, it's the sort of bread and butter of consultancy work is, is preparing reports um, and then based on that um, you tend to specialise in consultancy so there's always something um, you will be um, attracted to um, in terms of in terms of me as an ecologist um, I was sort of um, steered towards international ecology work and uh, but I could have easily have become a um, a great crested newt eco um, ecologist herpetologist or I could have become a, a bat expert um, or in some cases um, some ecologists actually try to do everything and um, and that's what I tend to be. I tend to be a generalist, and then I tend to tend to get in other specialists to support. So I tend to be a sort of ecology project manager over over okay. the over the time I've worked professionally. Um, but um, yeah, I think international ecology is always what comes back. If I look at my career and all the companies I worked for, so I worked for Amec, a company called Jacobs, big American company. Um, company called Rambo, a Danish company. There's always been international work there that I've that I've done, and that came from my first job with AMEC, um, doing right. all these, going all these around these pl um, places around the world, really gave me quite a specialism in terms of international um, work. So, and, what, what kind of area, what things do you need to know that you to be an international ecologist that, yeah, you know, over and above yeah. what you need to yeah. be? Yeah, well, think about think ecologist. about it. Yeah, think about. I mean, think about an, a UK ecologist. Uh, you need to be aware of protected species, so great castor newts, uh, reptiles, common common lizards, um, snakes, um, adders, um, grass snakes, smooth snakes, etc. Yep. Um, and and that's quite a small pool of um, species to to focus on. So it's you know it's it's easier to uh, to manage that um, that level of um, species. But when you come to the international level. You're talking about, you know, one region of the world, for example, West Africa. You're talking thousands of species, and so there's some international. Yeah, yeah, you may potentially be screening um, um, many species, and and if you think, you know, if you're in West Africa, West Africa is very different from Central Africa. Central Africa is very different from the Middle East, and um, and um, and the ecology there. So you have to be um, quite a generalist um, and um, and be readily adaptable to what um, ecology is in that particular area. So there's some guiding um, tools and um, and databases that we use. Uh, one of these is the International Union of Conservation and Nature Red List of Threatened Species, and um, this highlights critically endangered, endangered species. And these are the real sort of guiding principles when we connect them to to international lending requirements. So if a particular project wants to build a mine, for example, a gold mine, and they want to um, um, gain uh, money from banks, lending banks, 
you know, high street banks such as Barclays or HSBC, then they have to adhere to a set of standards. And these standards are guided in terms of environment, social aspects, cultural heritage aspects, ecology, biodiversity aspects. And, um, and this is what I really specialised in is the biodiversity um, aspect of, um, of the standards which this belong to the International Finance Corporation. And you can get these online, all, all, um, all um, uh, freely available. And they set out the standards which by, um, whereby projects have to follow um, very carefully what they have to do. So, and in many cases, they're actually audited. So, you know, banks will expect um, a particular project to have fulfilled uh, certain parameters in terms of critical habitat. Critical habitat might be very specialised habitat which um, which um, supports endangered species. But, yes. uh, you know, examples like um, rainforest, uh, primary rainforest, um, uh, wetland areas. These sort of these sort of uh, very sort of specialised um, habitats which encourage sort of um, diversification of um, certain species. So just to be clear, are you saying that banks have got a very strong influence on the preservation of biodiversity? Oh, uh, that's a good question. And I would say yes and no. Uh, in some cases, in some projects, they do have very stringent controls in place. In other cases, that is not the case, um, especially where um, Banks, let me see, how do we say it? Banks have not been so stringent in terms of ensuring projects um, follow the correct standards, which is a shame. And in fact, I only came across a project the other day um, whereby the bank slipped up and um, I did not ensure the project followed um, the protocols necessary. And now we're, yeah, we're having to go back to the project and the bank and say, look, this work hasn't been done. This, this auditing hasn't been done. So um, hopefully the bank will learn from that and will will go on to improve its systems. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you're working directly with the International Finance Corporation, then they will absolutely stringently make sure they you follow um, the standards that they lay down, and um, and there's no getting out um, or getting around them in that in that case. So it can vary depending on the lending institution. Yeah, that is fascinating. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I, I just um, like to think about or like you to, to talk a little bit about your transition because you've mentioned um, you went from university to AMEC to Jacobs to Ramble and now you are now I'm with a company called um, SMEC which is S-M-E-C which okay. is ironic given I started my career with a company called AMEC. Um, yes. So this is an Australian company, um, Snowy Mountain Engineering Corporation. Uh, they're owned by uh, a, a Singapore company called Sabana Jurong, uh, big, a big um, architectural firm. And um, here I am in, in Jakarta, Indonesia, and um, I'm working on some exciting projects at the moment. Um, um, one of them is uh, is a mining project um, in Indonesia, which um, um, has a terrestrial aspect to it, as well as a marine aspect to it. Um, I've been working on mangroves in Vietnam and uh, working on a project, a large automobile project um, called VinFast. They're hoping to produce electric mopeds and electric vehicles. And um, they built their plant on a sort of very wet, lowland wetland area uh, mm. near to a very famous um, UNESCO um, uh, um, biosphere called um, Cat Bar. If anyone's gone traveling out in Southeast Asia, they might have heard of it. It's, uh, you might, you, or you might have seen it on, on films like James Bond, where James Bond goes uh, cruising around in a speedboat and you yes. have these um, limestone, limestone cast um, sort of um, um, things that sort of come out of the sea, and um, wow. it's just amazing um, area, and um, and not t not too far away, they actually built this uh, large automobile plant near to, near to the city of Hanoi, 
and um, this is this has been a really um, interesting project because we had to do a critical habitat assessment. This is another um, um, product that we use um, to to screen for protected species uh, to ensure the project has fulfilled its IFC uh, requirements. Um, so um, and that often leads on to things like biodiversity action plans where we produce documents to guide the project in terms of its delivery. Um, for various actions like setting up new um, habitat offsetting. Um, and in this case, it was um, setting up new mangrove habitat. So there's some, yes, yeah, some positive, uh, some many pos many projects you may think, oh, Kaiki mining is so, so damaging to the environment. Um, it is correct, absolutely true. There's no denying that. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't have things like mobile phones, fridges, cars, if it weren't for mining. And um, I think we all contribute to mining um, and the damage that mining does in some shape or form. And that's for society to to push on with its um, goals to try and uh, become less uh, less materialistic in terms of uh, the metals that we use and need for various technologies. OK, and in the meantime, you're doing your bit to try and minimise the amount of damage that. that yeah, might... yeah. Well, this is it. This is it. It's very much about sort of um, protect, trying to protect the environment and do as much as you can to to steer um, clients away from unnecessary damage and uh, and and show them that there are positive alternatives in terms of um, um, tools like offsetting and uh, and um, a lot of conservation work is also connected to it so um, in terms of sort of endangered species we might need to look at specific um, species plans to um, encourage um, encourage um, the population to to increase uh, rather than on its current trajectory of decreasing excellent well that's been absolutely fascinating um, thank you very much for speaking to us um, Phil and um, and I'll um, thank you, I'll Phil. To, yeah, to talking to you again. But um, thanks sure. to you. I hope people who are watching have enjoyed your insight. Um, I know I have. I know I've learned a lot. <laughs> so definitely, thank definitely. you very much for that. Well, maybe as a passing passing um, helpful um, comment, I would say one of the biggest important things is if opportunities come your way, grab them with both hands because you just don't know where it's going to take you in life, and um, and that's been that's been I think that's something that university encourages you and enhances in you is this is this um, um, option to you know look at um, opportunities. I think yeah that looks good. I'll go for that. And often it just leads on to the next thing. And I can just look back over my career and I can see that every job I've done connect is connected somehow to the previous job. So um, it's just getting into the system. And for that you need a really good CV. So that's the most important thing I think I can perhaps um, pass on is making sure you've got a really good CV. Um, there's lots of tips online now um, or try and find a CV mentor um, that tells you how to set out a CV nicely. And I think this this is one that was one of the really um, earliest skills I learned, um, which can help anyone, I think, um, um, if, it, if they're at the start of their career or, if, or still at university thinking about it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Good to see you and good luck um, to students <laughs> if they're finishing university or just beginning or in the middle. Um, it's an exciting time. I can tell you it just can't compare to the work, professional life. Um, make the most of it. Enjoy it and, um, and see where life takes you. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil.